Exodus 18. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt after Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro took her back along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershon, for he said, I have been an alien in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came into the wilderness where Moses was encamped at the mountain of God, bringing Moses' sons and wife to him. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed down and kissed him. Each asked after the other's welfare, and they went to the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had beset them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel in delivering them from the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because he delivered the people from the Egyptians when they dealt arrogantly with them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses set as judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel and God be with you. You should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions and make known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men among all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case themselves. So, it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden of you. If you do this and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure it, and all these people will go to their home in peace. So Moses listens to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from all Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor cases they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went off to his own country. This is the way we're going. Exodus 18. Exodus 18. Our thesis. The sons as a Messiah in the family. The sons as a Messiah in the family. When I was little, when I was little, I used to get kicked out the house all the time. Straight up. Started from like the age of maybe, let's just say, shoot, the first, I still remember the first time I got kicked out the house. Actually, I ran out the house and my mother locked the door behind me. I had my underwear on and that's all I had. I had a pair of tighty whities on. 
and I ran out the apartment. I was gonna get a whipping for something. I can't remember what it was. I think I remember what it was. I had broken the kitchen drawer handle. And instead of like coming out and just telling the truth about it, I had put the I had put it back. I had put it back and kind of like jammed it in. And I think my mother was the next person to open that drawer. <laughs> I think she was the next person to open that drawer. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe somebody else opened it and put it back in the same way I did. But I was definitely the one who broke it because I pulled out the drawer and because I was too little. I might have been second grade. I might have been second grade. Yeah. Or first. I was in first or second grade. And I, was, I, pull, I would pull out the drawer to get to the cabinet on top. So I couldn't get to the cabinet on top. So I would pull out the, I would open up the, the, uh, the cabinet on the bottom, stand on that, then pull out the drawer a little bit, and then stand on that, and I can get into the cabinet on top. <clears throat> and what happened was I pulled it out, and this time, instead of like stepping on the side, I, I stepped on the, like, the front part where the handle is, and it just popped off. The front, the front of the drawer popped off. So it's like the, door, the drawer was there with just, the, just the, the face of it with the handle just fell on the ground. So it was like if I had to close the back, you could just see right into the drawer. What I did was I picked it up, and I saw where they had little inserts where you could just put it back in. So I just put that boy back in and kind of jammed it on there and just closed it back gently. My mother probably seen me many a times do that. So she already knew when she went there and opened it up, just yanking it open, and that boy came off. <laughs> she already knew it was me because I'm the only one that had to climb up on She came and asked me about it. I lied. I lied. And then it was like, well, you're going to get a whipping for it. And uh, I think I went to tell the truth or something like that. But my mother's whipping was vicious. And so she came to go ahead and get her little cord and whip me. And I had, I had on the underwear on, tighty whities. And normally, if my mom going to whip me, it's like, I'm about to give you a whipping right now. She'll go looking for something. You will, you will scrabble and run to go get a pair of jeans to put on. Maybe a pair of jogging pants on top of that. Maybe another pair of jeans on top of that. Probably two hoodies. Probably a sweatshirt. You know what I'm saying? To go ahead and get all uh, puffed up like the mission man. Because you needed that type of insulation from the one she was giving up. <laughs> I didn't have time. Because if I remember correctly, she was able to turn right around. And that cord was right there. She was on me. I took like three of those boys to the grill and I was like, no, these are the ones that's gonna open that skin up and give you that, give you those little, uh, give you those little horseshoe boys. I'm like, mm -mm. that skin was too much. So I ran through the apartment. She was chasing me. And I opened up the back door and ran out. She locked it behind me. I was out there inside the apartment building with just my tidy whities on. That's the first time I ever got kicked out. I ain't being kicked out like maybe 25, 30 more times out the house. Sometimes I would get kicked out for like four hours. Sometimes I would get kicked out for like five or six days. You know what I'm mean? saying? <clears throat> Eventually, come 10th grade, I just got to, she kicked me out and I told her I was never coming back. And that was the end of that. I picked up that thing, that generational curse. And like when I got married, it's just like a quick end to it, that you find a solution to your anger or what have you. When I got married, I took to just kicking my wife out the house, straight up. We would get into it and we'd be talking back and forth and I'd be like, I'd be like getting to the point where I'm like, this is getting nowhere. She's not really following my logic. It don't really appear like she's listening. I'm really just furious right now. You know what I'm saying? And I was just like, you know what? Just get out. Just like that. I will kick her out all the time. And she might like just be outside for a few hours and maybe I'll cool down, she come in. Other times, early on, you know what I'm saying? She would like go to her mother's house. But I actually kind of forbade that. And y'all probably like, how can you forbid her from going wherever you kicked her out? I would be like, look, don't go to your mama's house. Hey, don't go there. Because I ain't got time for it. So I, started, I got to kicking her out all the time. And when we ended up having children, we had seven of them, I would be like, look, leave my kids here, but you gotta go. 
And it was a generational curse. And I just began to, that, that demon started to really like tempt me every single time. And so when I was reading this Exodus 18, like it literally came straight into my spirit, right into my heart, the Father that gave me revelation. And when he said that Jethro was bringing Moses' wife and his two sons back, he, he sent them away. As you read through the chapter, you get this feeling that the stresses of the leadership that Moses was trying to provide for those people would get to him. And he wasn't able to all the time be able to handle those stresses and the difficult position of being a man of God and feeling all alone in that aspect. Because he did feel all alone in that aspect and he begged the Lord to let him bring his brother Aaron with him. And the Lord had said, that's not really a good idea. I really don't want Aaron, I just want you. But Moses was like, no, I'm gonna get Aaron. So he ended up bringing Aaron along. Aaron and Miriam both came along. His, his, uh, his brother and sister, well, both of them ended up causing grief anyway. But as you can see, man, the chapter depicts Moses as basically bearing that burden all along. And the burden that he had was that he was going to lead them out of Israel as a bona fide liberator, out of Egypt as a bona fide liberator. But then after that, he was going to have to lead them as the only man of God to teach them for the first time as a new nation. What is the Father requiring of us? And what should our life be like? Like a bona fide, look, bona fide pioneer. Like having to take them into the wilderness and teach a whole people all brand new stuff to the multitudes and it wasn't no few people. And the stresses of that is like he sent his wife and his two sons away. And I was just like identifying with that on a very small scale. Not having done anything close to that. But like having been in the construct as a man you find yourself pouring a lot of energy and a lot of space into things outside of your home. So when I first started off in my career I was a school administrator dealing with a lot of people, a lot of families. In fact, I was like the dean of students. So I was dealing with like all the students that was like getting kicked out, getting into fights, and dealing with, whole, I was dealing with the social workers in the school, and dealing with the parents, and dealing with the grandparents, dealing with foster parents, dealing with the government too. Um, kids getting in trouble for truancy or getting in trouble outside of school with the law. So I was the interface for all of that. And I was seeing like the worst of it all, the real bad kids, you know, stuff like that. And I was pouring a lot of energy into that. Later on in my career, I became a politician. So I went from that, dealing with those type of stress and handling that, to then, boom, into politics, representing 90,000 people at a time or so, and dealing with all the issues that come with that. And at no point in time, at no point in time, did I ever sit back and think about how the type of energy, the type of verb, man, the type of will, the type of power that you're giving away outside of your own household and pouring into people who you may not ever see again. People who may not ever really actually appreciate the work that you're doing or furthermore, ever really come into a full awareness of the purpose that you're carrying in front of God. And by saying that, what I'm saying is, is that you may be trying to teach them or manifest the Father right in front of them through your spirit and they may never see it or never get it. In this Exodus, I told you that this whole book is about the education, man. This whole book is the education of the nations. And every chapter is gonna have a theme and a backdrop of thesis about education. And this next step in education shows us a couple of things. It's, it's, the Father's demanding us a couple of things. He's demanding a generation of men as pioneers as sons of God, newly minted, to begin newly minted and start new nations with your families, your wife who he put you together with to start that new nation, a woman in front of God. Both of you are naked and committed to his purpose and will. He's putting you guys together to do something. He's saying, you're my son. And one of the things that he's showing us in this chapter that's highly important is that you need to be able to properly identify your role and your space, and your purpose. It says in Genesis 2 that you're going to till the ground, etc., etc., but it says be fruitful and multiply, and I'm going to break that down for you from this aspect of Exodus 18. The title of it is, 
the sons of God as Messiah in the family. Messiah meaning teaching. And I showed you all before at how Christ sat down and it said that when he had saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain and then he sat down. He had gotten to the highest point of what his influence was going to be. And then humbly, he seated himself. He didn't become more arrogant or whatnot. And then, as opposed to holding a scepter and telling people to bow down to him, or you go do this, or I'm going to count you, or I'm going to tax you, and then put this gold crown on my head, or you guys, you 10,000, go build this, and you 24,000, you go build that, and then you 5,000 over here, you, you go make bricks. Instead of doing that, he sat down and began to teach them the things of God. He, Christ, was properly called Messiah, teacher. And so what I had showed you all before is that the highest form of kingship, that the highest form under, under the Father that you can ever reach as a man is to become a teacher. For you and your family, the highest purpose that he can ever give you is to make a nation out of you. I showed you that. I showed you that through Abraham, through Moses. He showed you time and time again in the Bible. He'll take him and say, here go your wife. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be fruitful I'm going to take you to a place. And then I'm going to establish you there. That's the highest purpose that he has for a man, woman, and child to create a nation out of you. For the union. For the man, the highest purpose that he has is to be Messiah. That is, to be able to teach. And so this generation of men are finding themselves in this weird position that I've seen it all over the internet, in which you're looking and you're saying, well, the women aren't doing this. They're not doing that. They're not all that. They don't know anything. In the Kevin Samuels era, you're finding men who are looking at the women saying they're not really ready. And I found myself like that within the marriage, but not also understanding that I wasn't really ready as well. But looking at what I'm proposing the woman to be. Oh, are you cooking, you cleaning, you doing what I say? And if those things, those goals aren't being met, it's like, man, these women right here in this generation, they good for nothing. And a lot of us are finding ourselves being filled with that spirit of resentment and frustration. But in Exodus 18, the Father calls on us and corrects us in front of God. He says, no, the best thing that could ever happen to you is that I give you a woman that has not been that, that is an open state that can be teachable because guess what? She didn't come ready made. And so what you should be looking at when you come across one of these women is, the only question that the Father gave me to give you is, is she doing her best? Is the efforts that she putting down, do you believe that she's giving you her best effort? The Father gave me that revelation to give to you all. Now there's a woman out there who who is going to present herself as unteachable. I'm not saying that you need to be running around with that. There's a woman out there today in this generation, man, as, and totally absorbed with the wickedness of this generation. And they're taking the women in this generation and they're completely usurping their spirits and soul out of their rightful position in front of God. And instead of being wise gatekeepers, they're ushering in a wicked regime. A lot of them are worshiping other gods. A lot of them are chasing other purposes and another will of another God. But if you find a woman able to be taught and has a, a good spirit of the Father upon her, she's not going to be perfected in this generation. I'm telling you that. She's not. But what I'm trying to tell you all is that you're forgetting that the heavy burden is on you to be able to teach. And what happens is in your frustration, you keep sending her away. The scripture calls on that Messiah to be long suffering and to be able to teach and to be able to take a lot of punishment and pain. That's what it calls on for a man, a son of God. To be able to make sure you're able to absorb that so that you don't miss the opportunity to be able to teach unto your wife, to be a perfected woman of God. And then be able to teach unto the next generation so you can correct all those generational curses and break all those generational curses that you were supposed to. Moses instead puts his energy outside of the household. And it's his father-in-law who also 
who also presents him with the idea that you can invest in others before you invest in your own household. That's not the father's way. I'm getting somewhere. Father. I'm getting somewhere. Because I had, I had gotten a kick in my wife out, but as I matured, and as the father actually began to just change me, it's no, it wasn't no work of my own. He began to change me, temper me out. He would cause me to be more repentant about things that I was saying and doing. And most of all, he gave me his word. Most of all, he gave me his word, and he began to present himself to me and to my wife to validate me. I'm going to give you something new here. A lot of you men can't get the proper respect in front of your wives and in front of the women who are teachable because you haven't taken on your proper role. And when you step into your proper role of respect and dignity as a Messiah teacher, when you finally step into your proper role as a Messiah teacher in front of her, she'll respect you. And I'm going to guarantee that. And the reason why is because when you do that in front of your family, in front of your wife, the one that the father gave to you, the father will do you a big favor. It's scriptural. He does it every single time. He says that women are naturally inclined to be spiritual. And they're looking all over the earth for God. They're looking for the father. And they can't find him. Because they don't understand that the only way they're going to find him, and a lot of women are going to flip out over this when I say this. They don't understand that the only way they're going to find him is through the man. You heard me right. The only way the woman is going to see God and find him is through that man. She wants to go off on her own and go and pray to the sun and the moon and the stars or Orisha or run off into any, um, any rocks or um, stones and, and get into astrology. She has a spiritual inclination. But since she's out of line and out of touch with the man who was put here, she's never going to actually see God not going to happen. She's going to have to be able to come to have contact with the Father and His Word through the man. That's how it's set up right there. You can go find it in Genesis. It says that God came unto the man and told him and showed himself to the man. Then, with the man, he showed himself to the woman. And then they told her, this is what thus says the Lord. You see that? I'm getting somewhere, man. Just pay attention. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that because of that relationship, because of that relationship, and it must exist like that for it to be a proper relationship in front of God, you men have to take your, your role. And then she will respect it because that's what actually what she's looking for is built into her spiritually. And if she is not accepting that, and she won't accept the teaching, and I will submit to you, she has demons, she has an inappropriate spirit, she's unfit to be a woman to be able to build a nation with. And you do need to keep it moving. But if she's teachable, she'll do it. Because the, the, the spirit of the Lord and the word of the Lord is true. And I'm going to show y'all a new thing. He says that when you take your proper stature in front of her, he's going to do you a big favor. He's going to show up. And that will be the first time in her life that she's seen the Father. She's never seen him before. I guarantee you. She may have thought that she had seen it. She may be up in the church and see somebody start doing a strange limping dance and bopping their head around and think that that got something to do with it. Or she might have been to some group session where they closed their eyes and put their fingers together and did this and felt like she felt it. She may have come across every thing that's impersonating God on this earth, running around giving people weird feelings and euphoria. But it's not until she comes across one of the sons of God, her man, that she was put with to build, to build a nation. And he steps into his proper position as righteous man, made in the image and likeness of God, and presents himself as a Messiah to the family. Then she will know for the first time in her life, I'm with the man of God, the son of God, and the Father shows himself to us daily. It'll be the first time she'll experience that, and it's going to validate you. Because it's only through you now that she will know God. And she will know that God is with you. And that's all women want to know. You're thinking it's your money. You're thinking it's your influence. You're thinking it's the amount of cars you have or how handsome you are. The type of soup that you bought. How many drinks that you can buy her. What you got in your bank account. Your stock holdings. 
or the motion in the ocean. You think it is all of that. What you do in the bed at night? No. She will finally come to respect you in all your honor and dignity as a son of God, made in his image and likeness as Messiah. When you step into that role, and in the minute you do that, the father comes and stands right beside you and says, this is my son. Listen to me. He gonna come. He does it for Abraham. And he told Sarah, he said, listen, this my son, listen to me. He showed up. He, and she, she want to believe it. <clears throat> and Abraham just, you know, cool and I'll be a metal like, I know I haven't held myself out as perfect in front of her, so she don't really want to respect that. Then the father said, okay, I'll prove it to you. You have a baby next year. She laughed at him. The father said, why you laugh? She tried to deny it. He said, no, you laughed. But we're going to see. She had that baby. After that, she understood that regardless of whatever I think I see with Abraham or whatever, I know that he's the son of God and God is with him. That validation right there gives him all the respect that he needs to carry out his role as son of God, Messiah, nation builder, man in a family. 